of us together in this meditation. It is the Secret Energy Worldwide Meditation. This is day 17, and we're going strong. We're definitely really, really harmonizing in with the planetary centers. We're co-creating and connecting with each other. We've made this organic grid all around the world. Everybody is here with us, so you get a chance to witness everybody's geometry rather than just some you know, some shape, like I've been noticing these meditations, it's just like the shape on the screen, and you know, some hexagon or whatever. And it's like, you know, it's so relevant now to keep dialing in and keep getting better. I'm not saying that we've done anything wrong in the past. I'm just saying we're always encouraged to use our uniqueness and, and actually uh, bring more harmony to the entire spectrum. And so to me, what that means is, is that instead of just meditations with geometry playing on the the most beautiful geometry is what's seen from the human being and showing all of us together and showing, you know, us in presence and, and in unity is a powerful mantra in itself. It's a powerful mandala and design that actually projects something that is so much more meaningful in these times. It's so much more meaningful for us to get here and to, to show and to show and to share and to connect with each other. We also today have a massive build so i'm not going to be too long-winded on today's meditation hopefully um and this is also because we have key makers season two happening today which is another amazing build where we're going to get in uh, for the first time today and we're going to begin to look at uh questions but from the lens of the person's path so this should be quite interesting it'll also give some that uh have just found out about enneology or um maybe looking to get into it it'll give you more of a, a scope to just what it's capable of doing so everything here is in tune but what i do need everyone to do you know there's fools rush in as they say there's no need to speed through perfection if you do have some Palo Santo or some sage on your side of things, I also see some new faces. Welcome. It is good to light that to make sure that you're clearing the space. We have a tendency to move a lot of energy uh, collectively and co-creatively, just like if you're lifting a couch by yourself, it's pretty tough, but it's four of you, no problem. You just take your corner. So that's how it works here. We really upgrade each other. Each of us have strengths and weaknesses. We work in the invisible because it does exist. It's just like air. You don't see it, but it's the most vital thing. So too, there's many things that are clear in themselves, what we would call pure, and those become the primary fuels for our existence. This has also been a collective build. This means that there is a story going on here. We're not just coming in, meditating, and, and maybe buy some tones or just sitting there. We've decided to also... Uh, create a very strong initiatory phase from our cosmic university by actually explaining what the days of the week really mean and what energy is coming from those days, coming from the knowledge of our ancestors from thousands and thousands of years. And we've showed how that not only ties into the newer cultures, but more importantly, how in the ancient times it was most important that every being coming into the initiation of life knew the characters in the story because synonymously the supreme beings in the story etc synonymously they would come to know themselves they would realize that these powers and these forces are not external they're actually internal and thus they would unlock their own world and unlock be able to unlock their own world and create their own cosmos within as our parents have done of course we do need something to say to us what are those tools to do that with and that's what this experience is really about to give us the knowledge of the gods you see as they see you've bitten from the apple which is the pentagram and and uh 72 degrees times five and perfect phi and pi and prana that's all of what the shapes and the spirals and all that are really about and that is th what we've been working with in this maat or matter which is perfect math that's where we get that word from we've been working in that through our experience not just in practice not just by reading something but the actual experiences that we've been having in life so it is quite interesting to have an entire experience that you really don't know uh what are the full details to it i actually think that that makes it maybe a little bit more fun sometimes when you know everything about everything you think your way out of the the excellent part of it so it's important that we've come together in this space and we've twined together with many different forms of uh, communication here on this planet, meaning that 
each of us have uh, what's akin to a silver line or an umbilical cord or what the spider sees as its web that we tow behind us. It is our DNA, it is our frequency, it is in our memories, and it also overlays with others as we come in contact with others. So we begin to create this woven blanket of existence and life. And for many, that can get a little bit confusing after a while because it's like you're in the jungle and you're going deeper and deeper, but you never left really a path or a signal of where you came in and how to get back uh, if you wanted to. And so what we're also here to do for each other is to continue to light resplendent as beacons on the path, showing you exactly where you are and where the way is back to yourself. This is not about me. This is not about your favorite conscious superstar uh, or, or them and whatever they have going on. You are the central character in this theme. We feel personally and externally, co-creatively, that if you fix yourself, you're doing the greatest thing for everybody else. If you are broken, truly, you have a tendency to go and just break more things. So it's great, and even in other people's lives. So it's great to take the moment for yourself to bring yourself into alignment and actually start learning how to really worship self and be into self. And I know that may sound crazy for some, but the interesting thing is we know more about these external gods at times than we do about our own anatomy. We know what they want, what they eat, what they like and all that. But for, for us and what our body needs, we don't have a clue. What does the spleen really need? What kind of vitamins does it really need? What kind of nutrients? What about the pancreas? So we know very little about the internal God, which is the only true God, but we know everything about this external God. So now, since the world has been given uh, an edict of Sabbath, which means that from the higher levels of things, the higher laws that trump over lower laws, which we talked about yesterday, while it may seem to you like your corporations are desisting and up to another nefarious scheme of making themselves more money, and that's how they theatrically want to print that on the news, they've actually already been told to desist. They were forced to desist. Many of the conscious community uh, uh, members remember them saying this. I remember them saying this out of their own mouth. They seem to get, be getting confused now, thinking that all of what's happening is a part of the new world order. <laughs> it's kind of like a, a, a double pun. Yes, there is going to be a whole new world, a whole new world order. There's going to be a new order to things. In fact, that order is going to be more in the original place of what it should have been uh, before it came into disorder. But the first thing is, is that there must be a desisting. Like in the court of law, they tell you cease and desist. So stop. And now the world, because we've been spinning on this energetic wheel, this fake chakra called in industry and capitalism, etc. When that has been told to desist or stop. Many have been like, whoa, that's like stopping on a merry-go-round that you've been on for like a long time. And now that it's time to get off, some may be a little disorientated, a little dizzy about the world that they built. And so what we're here to do is we're able, we're here to bring stability. That's what a lot of these words like foundation are about and grounding is about. Because when you get into high levels of meditation, everything starts to spiral. That's why sometimes you even start rocking back and forth as the chakra field picks up. And if you do step out in the wrong direction, you actually get an inertia of what feels like being dizzy. And so this dizziness or this worldliness, if you may, is a common phenomenon of going through the experience and trying to come to grip with what it is that you want to have in this experience, what it is that you want to do in this experience. Your chakras, especially when you're a child, are so open that every single thing that you engage, you engage almost on the highest level of what it could be. So even just a little inanimate toy becomes a character. It starts to talk. You know, it has a name. It has a place at the table. So every single thing that you're inter interact interacting with, you're interacting with in a hyper way. And that is, of course, because your senses or your centers are completely open. And, of course, you're way more in gratitude and appreciative to the experience. But as you get older and as that starts closing... Literally, these are clothes that I'm wearing. It is something to cover the chakras. As that is, as I'm closing, now I'm starting to perceive less and less of the reality. I'm turning down the stimulus. And many need that because they have become so overwhelmed by all the talking, all the sm smelling, all the seeing, all of these things that are coming in and bombarding in the world. That's just the way that it is. They learn to turn that down using the governors of the body. This is very similar to when you're tuning an instrument as we have organs 
you're tuning the organ and you're tuning it down. This command actually goes to the thymus gland also. The thymus gland is even told by this consciousness that you have, I don't want to see these things. And you start to dictate what it is that you no longer want to see. This is also how you're able to curve out or block out other things that are also in the reality that are like in what I call in the corner of the eye. This is how you can begin to neglect and, and get rid of the awareness of even the place that you're standing on and its possible importance to you, like what you're eating from, the earth and all the things that are around you. And then as you, what some would see as focus the lens more on something specific, it may be your high school crush, all your energy starts to go through those smaller portals and ventricles. This is the ebb and the flow of life. We breathe in and we breathe out. There's nothing wrong with this. But in the times where we see that it is time for us to actually find that middle point, what I call the micro breath, the part in us that realizes that we're actually beyond life, we're beyond the yin and yang, we're beyond the vibratory frequency. Now we must make the journey back home to self. And on the path, as we trust, we have guides on the path, actual guide stones that have set the order of how to return to self. And what we also did and what our ancestors also did is they left us secrets, clues, and mysteries, mostly inside of us. It's like, what, what, a, funny, what a funny situation when you're, when you're going outside to look for something that's inside, and then that's all part of the lesson and all part of the journey. But our ancestors hid the secrets and the mysteries to how to get in and out of matrices, which is basically means a mistress or one who is in the process of courtship. In and out of matrices, having the, we, we were given the ability to go in and out of these matrices, but each time going through the experiences, we would learn almost like an adventure, what is it to be in and what is it to be out? What is it to be a part of something and what is it to be separate? What is it to co-create more importantly? And what is it to be complete in total unity? Right? So these are now the two options that are unfolding for the conscious community. Co-creation, right? That's where externally we're all working together in a common practice of something that we want to achieve. But internally, total unity means that you actually come into the balance within yourself and you find us all there that have been able to achieve that been able to get rid of all of the spectrums and the colors and the changes and the ups and the downs and center more closer to the, the, what we call the center spindle. Some cultures call that North. North really is up. Depending on the dimensions that you're in, North is straight on a two dimensional plane, but up on a three dimensional plane. And when you're going up, you're going up to what is known as the Mount Maru. And you're really going to the center column or the spindle just like in a motor, you're going to the spindle where all the power really is. It's also very calm. There is what we call the center of the gap there, where there's this space. It's like the, the gap in a spark plug. It's where all the power is. And we learn about this power through the north, south, or zigzag aspect of going through this process of knowing who self is because it, it can be overwhelming. It can be a steep climb. It can be shocking to actually come into the awareness of yourself. So since, again, this is a continued build, if this doesn't make sense to you, it means that you may need to go back a few days, listen to what's there, because we've been gradually also climbing ourselves a mountain, and we've agreed whether this thing turns on or not, it's still internet. It's still subject to, you know, whoever's running internet. <laughs> but still, whether that's running or not, that every morning that we would come into this space, it's at 7 o'clock Costa Rica time, and we would do this meditation that was for the entire world, which synonymously for us is the entire cosmos. And that also, again, that in this process, we would also clarify as much as possible, as much as can be done in the English language and through also the essence that we emit, the true story of existence in order for those who have had misconceptions, have fallen into pits, and all the different uh, uh, turmoils that may come on the path, that they may, they, the path may be made straight for their feet. Straight means that 
why we have these two zigzagging paths going up the tree, as you see with the caudaceous staff, there's also the middle path. Straight also means that in your body, you have the ida and the pingala doing that same thing, running the energy of the body, and then you have the spine or the straight path. And the straight path, it, it is tough. It's straight and narrow is this path. It's tough because you can't even think about it. It's the part of yourself that when you can turn off both of these hemispheres, that cuts on. Now, you can do this, though. This doesn't mean it's impossible because you actually do this every time you go to, quote unquote, sleep at night. When you released the two wheels of the brain, Cain and Abel, as we call them in the temples, yin and yang, logical and, and, and intuitive, right? When we release them, now another state kicks in. And this state says, basically, you can have whatever you want if you know how to use it. And that's a lucid dreamer. If you know how to lucid dream, you go right into this world and you start calling it all up. Give me a beach. Give me, you know, give me this, give me that. And it'll start coming into focus. But we also have to remember, we would have never really conceived what to call up if we didn't go through an experience. And that's the ex respect that we give to all experiences. Now, the experiences are so intertwined. When we say experience, we're not even to think of it as X, something that's external, X experience. It should be experience because most experiences actually lead to many things that change things about you inside. They always say that the experience of life is what they say. The experiences of life is what the real thing is about. Just knowledge is one thing, but experience is what turns it into wisdom. So we do have some linguistic corrections to, to do. We don't want to over, over uh, harp on it. But experience is more of what is occurring every time we get into a relationship with something, every time we get into commune with something. And so what the message is about today is actually how to make sure that we're choosing great leaders. But we're going to move this word leader because leader is actually a reference to lead. And in this case, Saturn is the planet of lead and Saturn thus is leading that aspect of things. So we want to go even to words more of like, even look at the leader, so that's Saturn. Judge, which is Jew, Jew is Jupiter. And, you know, you see, this, you see the whole Jupiterian system. So each of these words are evoking specific energies. And ra rather than wrestling with the, the, uh, who, who that belongs to, if that's right or if that's wrong, it's better to just look at the archetype itself and say, okay, the judge is really the leader. Why? In the consciousness. Why? Because that's actually what we're looking to, for leaders to do. That is the action of the leader or the action of the judge. So we can get caught up into the name, the leader, the judge. But what we really need to be focusing on is what is the actual action that the leader and the judge are charged with doing that gives them such responsibility? To choose. To choose. So really, what you're saying to yourself when you're coming into something new, like this is today, it is Sunday, it is a new, this is Syria, it has everything to do with new things and your new everything, changing up everything. And it has to do with still the choices that you're making at every single moment. That's what's going to determine what gets changed up, right? So here's something that I want us all to dial into very briefly, just to take a look. So that way we can make sure that our A's match with our Z's, basically. That we, every time that we go through this process of going through all these planetary centers within ourselves and then seeing the external variants, that we're able to actually check back, if you may, like check your work, <laughs> to make sure that you understand the story properly because still within the symbolism in most cases, the symbolism is still going to be replete. What this means is, is that in the ancient cultures, the symbolism that was being used to represent certain things, if you could read into it, because it was often encrypted under several different symbols, it would give you the keys to knowing everything. But see, the reality is, is that if you ever looked at the Puranas, the Upanishads, or the Bhagavad's, and you just see how long these texts text are, you can only imagine why it was so much more beneficial to do a pictograph, <laughs> to zoomorphy, 
This means to actually use an animal, if you may, to explain multiple things. All you have to do is draw, in this case, let's say we draw this horse. And this horse means so many things. If you understand horses, if you understand how they function, how, how they actually even like to be trained. I know that may be clear, hard for you to understand, but there's beings that actually like to excel and like to learn new things and like to carry burdens because it's not a burden for them and have a lot of great strength and speed. So all of those different archetypes, if you may, would be put into a symbol to give you a grand idea of what was being expressed. Why, if there was, let's say, some kind of picture or statue and they told the person to meditate on it or to think about it, and then they would be enlightened or something would come to them, they were really speaking more of that if you knew the meaning to all of the symbols already, and then you sat in on one of these you know, these, these images, you would actually come into even a greater level of awareness of what you already knew by seeing what the artist who was also initiated and could not even shape, form, or fashion something if he was not or she was not in initiated into the mysteries of themselves would add a little bit of something extra even that you would be able to read into deeper. Now, once again, when you know the story of the days of the week, also four and seven, which is the nodes of the moon, which gives us nine positions. When you know that, you actually know the story of this particular cosmos that we're in. And I cannot stress this enough that nothing is finite in these realms, meaning absolute, that this is the only way, this is the only place that this happens. There's no other place. This is all there is. When you get into all of that, you're in the folly. In vibrations, there's a, it's virtually limitless with how many different variants. We're talking about specifically the code or the telephone number to Earth experience right now, that it is working in a specific order. That's why the days of the week were chosen and put in the order that they are. That's why the mathematics behind the days of the week, once you know the numbers of each day of the week, when you add those numbers up, they equal 34, and then you add 3 plus 4, and it equals 7, giving us 7 days a week. When you add all the numbers from 1 to 9, it gives you a number that adds to 9. So there is a very powerful synchronistic connection with the numbers deeper than logic. It is Ma'at, which was actually seen as a feminine goddess. So once again, we find, an ancient mother, we find that even the things that are often ascribed to being masculine are often feminine because of different misconceptions that have happened within the new occult dogmas that have been brought forth. However, I will, I will say that every time someone drew a female energy, they didn't actually mean a human female. There is an energy behind the eyes of the female. There's a female whale. I always have to bring this up because it does sound like, you know, rudimentary kid stuff, but this is what makes it click. There's a female whale. There's a female dolphin. So when we just draw a female woman, we're doing that because we're humans. So it works better for us to see if we can see what the femininity is inside of a picture of a woman versus if I drew a female hippopotamus, you may have a little hard time unless I put like a pink bow on it or something to realize that this is a female hippopotamus. But what we're really talking about is we're talking about the divine feminine. So when we look at this image here, which is Surya, okay? So this is in, let's say that in the Hindu tradition, this is the image of the sun. Now, bear witness still though, that from all the way from the beginning of at least the Olmec Maya and possibly even further back than that, the Lulu, all of even some of the Igigi, the Nagas, etc., were all tied into a specific system and were aware of a specific system that has morphed over time, especially as new languages were created, such as Sanskrit, and caste systems were put in place. And then there was even a shift to where the woman was then put on the bottom and the male was put on the top. Like people see Brahma or the highest as a male with a white beard. When from the conceptualization of what the masculine energy is, it never actually enters into the creation except for as a creation. So anytime before that, then it is not actually a conception at all. It is what we would say is unmovable. So the idea that the highest aspects of things inside the physical reality is a male is just like putting the one before the zero. And we talked about this. 
one does not go before zero. Zero goes before one. Even computers cannot work starting off with one and then the zero. It's zero, then the one. So what we're saying is, is that the womb is first. It's the whole. Everything. That's our word whole. That's why we use wholeness. So even statements like we are all one, actually we're all zero. There's a constant pun in this language to move a person one digit over. So they'll just be one click off of the truth. So the whole is first, and then what emerges from the whole is the one, and then creation begins. Now, this gets linguistically disturbed right away when, when we say the sun, in English, we see a boy. And right away, the folly begins. You begin falling down the ladder. Because, first of all, there is no dynamos at all. The sun is a dynamo. It's pushing off force and energy. Trees are collecting it even on the leaves like solar panels and putting it into the bark. Facts. So if a, something is pushing off energy, it actually has to have three poles. It has to have a positive, a negative, and a neutral. Or else it cannot generate. That's basic electronics, basic mathematics, right? And, and, and basic thermodynamics. So now if we look at then this image, what we see here, and I'm going to blow this up just a little bit. Let me bring it a little closer so I can mess with it. So this was still replete so far that Surya is not depicted as a male. Surya is depicted as a mother. Now, what happens here is that just the awareness of ancient knowledge lets you know that all all sat in darkness and then conceived. And once it conceives, that conception is what we call the divine mother. Okay, so the all is not a male. <laughs> the divine mother is what created the male. That's why you see Mary holding the baby with the baby boy, which is actually synonymous to her husband. Because if there's no other beings being created and the mother creates first, that means even the children that create after that are creating from what was given and through the mother. Now, to us, because our minds are perverted, that seems like some kind of perversion. Yet, in the reality, they're rife with perversions. But this maxim of truth is actually pushed off as a perversion in itself. When it's really, if you don't realize that the mother created the son, the son became the father and created through the mother again ad infinitum, then your math is off. And then on top of that, one does not, is not capable of grasping the origins. And this is why when you see the divine mother here, she's spinning the cosmos on her finger, which is the as above. And then she's also got the conch shell in her hand, which is the as below. Because the conch shell is synonymous with this, the realms from, from sea level, right? Why does water congeal at sea level? That is the beginning of the underworld. Now, I think we have this spook, this, we're afraid of the underworld. We're afraid of the underworld just like we're afraid of the deep levels of our consciousness. Is it something to be afraid of? I mean, all this bioluminescence, all of these beings, all of this squids and slime and warmness and all this stuff. Is that something to be afraid of if you haven't been there before and you work on fear? Possibly. But when you think about these underworlds, vast beings, you know, larger than whales, squids with huge brains, like whatever they got going on out there, I'm sure they, they turned it up quite a few different levels as far as what is capable of being done. But even that realm from the cosmos, which is the stars. And as we talked about before, that the, the, always the ancestors saw the ocean as space and that the light, lights that we're actually seeing inside of the ocean, or the lights that we're seeing inside of space are a reflection of the large beings that are inside of the ocean. OK, and as the template works, it also is a reflection of the beings that are actually inside of us. That's, a, that's the holographic projection, that everything is still within the singular being. So my organs, my pancreas, my heart, my brain, all of these are also synonymously connected to other organisms that have variants of these same things, which actually all break down to chemicals, bonds, neutrons, etc., periodic table elements, etc. 
but it extends throughout a vast level of creation that we're even we're not even here yet. <laughs> like just a little scathing of this little nail, pinky nail right here is about how much we began to experience. So truly the glass is not half empty here. However, you do need a map in this. Now the map is not the terrain itself. It can only show, it can only serve to assist you in knowing where you're at and where you need to go. But it is not the journey itself. So it is still something that you're going to have to go experience. You're not spoiling it for yourself because now you know the great mysteries. You're just getting yourself prepared to actually be able to respect your own existence and your own life and what you're actually going through, especially as you, in learning these codes and symbols of self, start seeing them all over the place in your life. And then your eyes are open, not to what is new, but what was to already what was already there. There's already a surprise waiting on for waiting for you. Now, also there needs to be some demystification, because this word sur does mean snake. The word sur sar sor sur all those words mean snake. So what happens is is that if we're from the north where we have this huge bird all the time <laughs> praying over everything, right? This is what happens. This is, again, how, like, let's say, for instance, the cultural prejudices and cultural racism has divided the bird from the snake or the dragon from, from the phoenix. Because you have what we call a snake hater. This is basically anyone that feels like snakes are personally the enemy. And then we have bird lovers. And these are those who feel like that anything to do with birds is the most highest, sacred, purest, everything, right? This is indoctrination. Preferences through two family lines that are more like Montagues and Capulets. <laughs> you need to figure out the Romeo story inside of yourself and realize how to unite these components and not polarize yourself with one or the other. Now, to be very simple. If you ever witnessed here snakes or birds in nature, then you get the point. While you see snakes as being poisonous and venomous, when that super, super taloned osprey is dipping through the air and that little mouse is running on the ground like, ah, boom, there goes your nice, beautiful bird right there doing the same thing that the snake would be doing to sustain itself. So as we dig into the chasm of the consciousness, we also have to be aware that there's these sub programs that are running that they're like channels, like channel locks in many ways to get us to steer our consciousness in one direction or the other. So far, that's been pretty much how we've been fueling ourselves is on this duality. Who is right? Who is wrong? We're fueling ourselves on that because if you don't have contrast, you don't have perception. So the grand beings have already put contrasts in play, as I say, uranium, koala bears, all in the same realm. So to get this full spectrum thing happening so that way we can start coming in through a stepped down version of the experience. Still very powerful nonetheless. This is why when we see symbolism like this, let me put this picture back in order really briefly here. We also see, again, the symbol of what I was saying before is the higher mind. This is the one that is running the show. You see that up there as the divine feminine aspect of self, which also has the masculine component. That's what we learned that it is parthogenic. Go look up the word yourself. Parthogenics means that it's the ability to beget itself. So they know that there's, first of all, there's quite a few reptiles here that are still parthenogenic, just to show you that this was normal. And then also in the sea, there are many beings, especially in the octopus uh, uh, family uh, genus, that are parthenogenic. They can generate from themselves. So the mothership from Lemuria specifically was a large being. Some call it Yamaya. Some have different names for it. A large being that it's in the physical now, but it contains masculine and feminine components, meaning that it can fertilize itself. And it is literally dropping seeds as it's moving. <laughs> so it's coasting across the ocean of space, dropping pods and seeds that are already paired up and ready to create life. 
And this is why what alchemical work is, is alchemical work is even if you look at certain conch shells, you see this in George Haeckel's Radiolaria. You look at certain conch shells and you look at certain mollusks. And what you witness is the heart by itself, the spleen by itself, the pancreas by itself operating. In the ocean, what we call a brain is just floating out there by itself, just a brain, none of the other organs. So the alchemical treaties, especially from Syrian, which we call Kemet, was basically about using those components from the ocean, if you may, or the space, and creating new forms. So human 3.0, i.e. the code of Darwin, crawled out of the ocean because the parts from the masters, those who had the vessels, the pottery, the dinkras, the designs, the cymatics, took different pieces from the ocean in order to form this new being. And so deeper in symbolism, when they show your dagons, when they show your mermaid, they're just really again, doing a bad explanation of where is the origins of life truly from? Why do we always go looking for water and something living inside of water symbolically to determine where life is? Because that's where life is now and where life has always been. And just like as you go in through as a child, you are now inside of your mother's womb, you are in water. And just as when you come out into this, this space and you think you left your mother, and we laugh about this, you're now inside of your mother again, a massive envelope of water. Turn on a distiller or turn on a dehumidifier right now and you will pull so much water out of the air just because you cannot see those little droplets. It doesn't mean that they're not there. And this aspect of going through these waters or these wombs and these birth canals, if you may, being birthed, which is mean to come onto the shore, to come onto the dock, all of those things are really about you also coming into existence and coming into these con coming into continuous existence. So there are beings that are aware of this and also know how to run this entire perfect sequence through their consciousness in order to continuously, uh, what we would say is go forward and go backwards and vertically through time. Meaning that if I know the sequence of life, which is called the order, that is the ring in itself. To know the order of life gives me the power of everything because I can not only explain and understand everything that I'm experiencing, I can also guide myself into the next experience that I want to have. Now, there is instinct. Instinct is, okay, if you get too far off over there, it will rub you back into where you're supposed to be through an instinctual way. But to move through reason that is the power of a supreme being. To move with your own might and your own power and ability, to project your own reality, to never let anything external waver your internal, that is that of the supreme being. And that's the tutelage that we're here for. That is actually the lessons that we're going through. So as you see here, again, then, you know now who is the higher law. This is a cognate of maritime OK, that just sounds like everybody's having happiness in time. Like, yeah, it's a man, we having a merry time. Time is existing because it's the physical, but it's great when we learn these maritime laws. But the real ones. <laughs> now there's even people who say they have the maritime law and it's just another variant of Black's law. This maritime law is metaphysical and exists within the consciousness, and it already says right away that there's nothing from the lower courts, as we talked about yesterday. Whatever they say is going to happen in the reality. You could be on the torture bed and laughing at them and go into some weird catharsis where nothing even feels painful and the room starts lighting up and they believe too. You can have so much awareness and knowledge of self and wisdom about self that nothing can shake that and is only completely coward when they try to go against it. Even elements have been cowered by mages in that respect that the element thought, I'm a ruby. <laughs> and the magus was like, truly you're nothing. Truly we're all nothing. 
And as the ruby was there staring it down, because all these are energy staring down who was telling the truth, the ruby turned into another gem. <laughs> there are absolutes here, higher laws. Like we talked about, if you build a dome and you hole out the floor a little bit and you build a, a, a plane inside of that dome, on the 33rd arc of the dome, if, I, if you say something, you'll hear it in your mind. If somebody else is standing on the other arc of the 33rd date, when you say something, they will hear it in their mind, but they won't hear you audibly. This is a fact. This is something that we can do in any time, any place, anywhere, if we just have a couple builders there. So this means that there's these mysteries, if you may, these secrets, these deeper things to learn about this relationship that we're in with this planet and with this existence and with ourselves. So if we get sidetracked on external variants, especially when we've already deemed that that internally is harmonic with us, it's, our, it's a part of us. At times, the only thing that it can reflect itself as externally is as a conflict. This is why many people in taking the gods externally went into war with the gods, which is like going to war with yourself. And they're still locked into that war. While you're being given these keys to actually unlock the full spectrum bridge within yourself. And you're also being given the reassurance that you're not the first one to do this. You're not the only one that knows this. There's actually a countless amount of beings that are aware of this, all residing in a certain space, already creating worlds, already doing massive things. And this is just your initiation. This is why it was said, and it was kind of, you know, some of our, New Age uh, interpreters may have kind of went off a little too far on their interpretation, but that an alien, an alien invasion would happen, and this would serve to draw humanity together. You remember that? Remember they were saying that an alien invasion is going to happen, and this is going to serve to bring humanity together. They're going to face a greater force that's going to give them no choice but to come together. So we thought... We start seeing, you know, seeing all these huge spaceships. You know, you got the, re, the redoing of Michelangelo's painting where now it's alien. And Jesus is there. And, you know, all this fictitious Alice in Wonderland, Disneyland stuff when we don't realize at times that an alien is a virus. An alien means foreign. It means that it's not your custom. So even if somebody that is not of the custom of another village comes in, because they're not in that custom, they're like an alien in that village. And their virus is when they act out in their own specific culture, which is a reference for a Petri dish, they get that onto others. Now he's over there smoking. It's like, where did you learn that from? You're smoking cigarettes now. It's like that alien came in here and he was smoking cigarettes. Now I'm smoking cigarettes like him because it's cool. You see what I mean? So that's what an alien invasion is. So now we have symbolically on the planet this alien rolling through. And so now we have our event where people are going to start coming together. We also have so many way showers and light workers and heat seekers <laughs> praying for the collapse of the Gog Magog and the, the, the systems of corruption and all that kind of stuff. So they're collapsing. So we have to have that other set of manifestors that say, okay, and then after it collapses, then we're going to do this. That's why I was talking about the day ascension having plans after the day you supposedly get healed you know some people are always coming in for the healing i need healing i need healing they go to every single journey ayahuasca whatever i need healing i need healing it's like man have you ever prepared for the day you actually finish getting healed because all the sad music and all the feeling sorry for self is a specific vibration and i'm telling you you cannot manifest in that vibration that is not the vibration of manifestation it does not attract the elements that are needed to actually get things happening the way you want. Everything here is a real attraction. It is a real communion. If the, if the beings out there, which is yourself, like you, then they're going to attract themselves to you. And if the things that you don't like, you definitely focus on the most and you feel that in your vibration the most, that is definitely what you're going to bring. But that's like the baby steps now. We've been hearing that for 20, 30 years from our masters. Let's say the occult masters and wisdom gurus. Now, it's about time to bring this into the 2020 version. So let's finalize here. We see below 
these horses running. This is also in our Zoroastrianism called the Great Manes. The Great Mane. Now, they say, and actually towards the end of Zoroastrianism, that the Manes got out of control. And that because they were so powerful that this caused and ensued lots of disasters. And then they go into these whole stories and these sagas. But really also what they're saying is, is that if anyone loses control over their organs and the magical powers within the chakras, <laughs> man, it's, it is like, it's like a, it's the power of a planet, but out of control. So this is why you have what is known as the charioter. So remember the Surya aspect, which is all the way on top. That's the top of your conscience. That's the higher law. This is seldom pinged. It's sitting on its own throne, meaning that the thrones are symbols of the, the actual when the world, the actual composite of the world. There's only one throne. So anytime you see two thrones, we're talking about. OK, so Surya on the top is sitting on a throne already. So that is isolated. And on the only the matters there are the, ma the deepest matters of life, the cosmos. The spiral, phi, creation, you know, geometries, all of the sacred cut, all of that is all of that's that's higher law. That's maritime. But then the charioter, because nobody is micromanaging here. That's why you have to learn how to put things that you even think are negative or just proper place. Put them in their place. Some of these beasts are very powerful. They run havoc in the mind, but they work great as feet. But they need to be trained. This is how the consciousness actually is functioning. It's wild, a rough cut stone until it's shaped, formed, and fashioned. And then it can catch all spectrums of the light. Like a trillion cut diamond shines brighter because it's catching more of the light. So that is the training that you go through when you're exercising. Now you're exercising these organs and these organs, as you're seeing here in this image, are these horses. These horses are the planets. These horses are the days of the week. This is why there are seven horses here. And then what you have seated, because this is the charioter, you have now the ability to command these powers. And without being, you know, exhaustible on this topic, because we will go ahead and get into today's meditation, which will be about Actually, since this is something new that is coming in, we're now choosing a new leader and judge inside of ourselves. We're learning more and more how to even do that for ourselves and what that really means. We're starting to become great custodians of our own power and our own energy and seeing how it works. We're also gaining this ability to be able to flip any kind of powerful, distorted aspects of consciousness that actually come at us. Oh, man, I think they're going to do X, Y, Z. This is horrible. This is crazy. It's like, man, you always are like that. Why are you so afraid of every damn thing? Like, if, if I can't spend just a moment in not being afraid or being updated with the next dramatic move, like I feed on that or something. I cannot eat that. Tell me something amazing about myself. Tell me, I mean, because surely none of this could have had continuously gone on, especially in anything like a loop. If we didn't already have figured out this, what's happening right now, and this wasn't all not a part of a catalyst to get us to the next stage, we would never be here in the first place. If existence had an end, we'd never start in the first place. That's how you answer paradoxes like the unbegotten or where, where did we ever come from? We started from nothing. So the end does not exist. And our ability of being here is the fact that that is how it works. And our also ability to not understand that keeps that safe. <laughs> I'm glad we haven't figured out where nothing comes from. We would probably try to unseat that too. But the sheer existence of who we are, it's like, well, where's that come from, mommy? Well, where's that come from, mommy? Where did daddy come from, mommy? Mommy, where'd you come from, mommy? <laughs> and where did that come from, mommy? Have you ever done that before? And then realize that, whoa, something had to come from nothing. Facts. So there is no, uh, that's, the, that's the tying in of it. That would be, the paradox that would solve death and we live it as a fact so life confirms death so do you see the power of the contrast life confirmed death 
So we're even saying that beyond life and death, there is something. And that's what I realized. I've had times where, like in some of these journeys, you lose your life. And then you realize you're still back there. You're like, man, you still back there? Like, yeah, I'm still talking to myself. Who am I? Oh, man, where are we at? I guess we're inside. But somehow we're still here. Where is here? <laughs> and then as you start playing around with that a little bit more, now all the whole reality starts coming flooding back in. Boom. Like it just all loads itself. And then you're giving this, and then you get this name. It's like, oh yeah, I'm James Bomar. Oh yeah, I do a secret energy. Oh yeah, yeah. I start. And it just all starts loading back again to prove that we do exist outside of this framework and we are conscious there. So as I said before, also, we are coming into earth. Many of us are coming into Earth to assist the situation that is happening here. We're not trapped here. They didn't close it in around us. Not claustrophobic being inside of a womb. It's an enjoyable place. But I'm here and you're here for actually something. Most importantly, holding space. It's the most important thing. Your vibration, your frequency is for sure something. This is why you can even be happy because holding the vibratory spectrum called happiness. A lot of our First Nations or indigenous tribes, as they call them, are doing that. They still live that simple life. The family's all there. They're cracking jokes, having fun, even though there's not lots of this stuff called money. And they're still holding that vibratory frequency and spectrum so that way when we come out of VR or wherever it is that we actually are now due to the Western suggestions <laughs> we can still know in our core in our heart well i just wanted to be happy anyway i just wanted to be you know like loved i just wanted to have that passion and that pleasure and you know without the the drawbacks of the entrapments we know what we want now in the higher mind that is how we get it and we utilize these energies and forces which this is factual no hocus pocus. You're not going to bow down to an external version of self. How could you even do that? Like when you look at ancient books, how did Jesus write his own name so many times? In the Bible? I didn't even, like, imagine me writing the Bible and, and then I'm writing in my own stuff and I'm putting my own name and I'm, name, I'm concluding the prayers with myself. How does that even sound? Like in, in, in James's name, this is how things are going to be done. That, that didn't even sound right. So we're able to demystify completely that all this external action and all these external stories have been no more useful than Disneyland at this stage. Now where we need to be is we need to know these symbols, we need to know these archetypes, also not as enemies, because we went through Saturn yesterday, there's a lot of tension there, always there. Instead of realizing that power within self and how you can come and actually put law and order with inside your own consciousness and your own body. Powerful and dynamic that will be for you. But even today, as it smooths in, you learn how to trump all that law. Saturn is black law. Saturn is the black horse that is sitting here. Just one of the horses. Even the charioteer trumps black's law. Let alone the maritime. So we do have ways, and these ways are exact. This is what's most important now. Now I'll say this and I'm done. Precision. See, when we start having all this equipment, you know, like you got these 3D printers, you got this. The cheap stuff, it has no precision. It cannot get you within a micron or within a millimeter, a couple of just one millimeter in precision, a micrometer. It cannot do that. It's all off. Every time you print it, you get something different. It makes it impossible to actually do a consistent run. However, the more expensive it got, the more the precision dialed in, the greater the craftsmanship. I see that as symbolic. The more you start really, instead of being all haphazard with the knowledge, just saying what Muji said or whoever said and just redundifying that, to truly know it, to actually know the symbols, to know the archetypes within you, creates this precision to make your worlds exist. Because the secret is imperfection is, abor is dearly aborted. 
This means if you don't know the order, you put the yin before the yang or the one before the zero. And then when you try to create something, it, mm, it just doesn't turn on. It comes back void. Okay? So if, to learn the world or to learn the word that does not come back void is to know yourself. In the beginning was the word and the word was with God. The word was God. You are God. That's why the front door of any lodge or temple is actually the back door. Facts. The front door of any temple that you see, Masonic temple, is actually the back door. Only the entered apprentice is allowed through the front door. This is all symbolic for that. You are the only one that can actually get into controlling your own consciousness to the highest degrees. By taking the laws and the rules in which your ancestors laid down when they built this temple. The template or the temple is already set. The, the bounds and the, the, the pillars are already set. This is the gift. Now you have to inhabit it. And that's why we said before that when you come to planet to the planet or into flesh like the descent of Anana, you lose all your powers and abilities. So that way you can see what they're all for. And when you get a time where you really feel like you need that ability, that's when those abilities begin to unlock and not before then. There's an extreme responsibility here with being able to control the vehicle. These things are very powerful to have full control over a complete chakra center. So it's a responsibility to get the keys to the car or the car. It's a responsibility that the parents are like, well, shoot, if you're going light speed and you hit something, man, you're going to tear everything up. So it's better for me to keep you at 7.83 hertz until you really learn to see what they're the chariot are sitting there. Now, they don't have planes and all that kind of stuff to put here in this motif now or something that show something that can depict even a horse is greater than depicting a car. A car damn near drives itself these days. A horse, you need to know how to ride or you can fall off. So, of course, many have fallen off their horses. It's all a part of learning how to ride horses. Anybody who knows how to ride horses, my daughter rides horses she's fallen off a couple times i'm like is this okay should we stop her from riding these horses and the main trainers is like no no we you fall off you just learn how to fall so oh, okay there's a deeper level to this thing so this is where we're at we have these powerful mains now remember main is an anagram for the word name the great main is the great names the great names are the tones coming from your organs only if you listen to yourself, which is, you know, bringing back in the third ear. The third ear is not the one that is the external two ears. There's the internal ear. It's a holophonic ear. It looks like a, it looks like a conch shell itself. And it hears these sounds and tones as you begin to meditate, as the activation begins to, to increase. A lot of times you just hear it as a ringing in the ear. Like my tone is always a, just, a, just variants of rings. So then you can actually feel yourself. And this is what's going to give you the encouragement. This is what's going to give you your own ability to not only motivate yourself, but also to find your way into the current. There's a process here. You find yourself. You need motors to do that sometimes. You need maps to do that. Where am I at? <laughs> you know, as everybody's, <laughs> where are we at? What am I even supposed to be doing in life? They're looking at a map and they're trying to work this rudder on their motor, trying to get back onto the current. Where's the school at? Where's all my family members? Where's my tribe? What we're doing here is we're lighting up like flares. We're over here from inside, though, because I've also learned and seen that if you light up a flare for people to come outside to you, they never find themselves. You cannot be coming into this about here's me, the master, <laughs> and making yourself this central character in the theme so much that it starts to damage what other beings, aspects of who they, they are, who they are. So that's why the pretext and the context around today's build was just so that everyone become aware of how to choose your leader, how to choose your judge, but most important to realize that it has everything to do with choice.
And mm -hmm. choice is actually up to you. I can't make choices for you. I don't flip the switch inside of you, right? You do it. So the power is actually all of yours, just like my power is all of mine. And this is just an expression of what I can do with this power. And it's only like the beginning because there's actually no end. So I can always stay at the beginning. I can, I can choose to be at the end or I can choose to be at the beginning. That's, that's the time travel aspect of yourself. So be jubilant. We're going to go through this clarification meditation if you want to get yourself together for that.